Hey, what's up YouTube? Today I'm going to show you a little tool I experimented with that allows you to combine multiple static mesh actors into a single one and also bake their animations into a tiny texture. The workflow is the following. You start by placing some actors in your scene. You then use a level sequence to animate them. Then drag that capture blueprint actor in your scene. Specify the list of actors to capture, how many frames to bake and the sequence to sample and press capture. You'll get a preview of the baked animation. If you like the result, you may select this procedural mesh component and convert it to a static mesh component. The animation texture should also be located where the level asset is. Now there's one annoying thing you have to do, which is to open that newly created static mesh asset and either turn off light map generation or change its destination index to at least 4. So it's nothing new, you may call that vertex animation texture, and there's two main ways to do this already in Unreal Engine. The first one is quite straightforward. Let's say you have an animated mesh in your 3D software. The technique for each frame writes each vertex position into a texture. So if the mesh have 2K vertices, you get a 2K texture in X, right, one pixel per vertex, per frame in Y. For this to work though, it needs to create a new UV map for that mesh so that each vertex sits precisely in its own row of pixels, if that makes sense. This technique also usually needs two textures, one for position and one for normals. That's the most common and simple vertex animation texture technique, but that's also the most memory heavy one. It's also quite limited in a lot of ways, like the amount of vertices. This won't work for a 60k vertices mesh, right? Because you need a 60k texture and that's not really an option. Blending two animations using two sets of textures is also a no-no, I think, with this technique. I could be wrong though, but anyway, that and poor LOD support and so many more limitations, but it's still a very useful technique and is one to definitely keep in mind. Skeletal meshes and skeletal animations are usually way, way more expensive than doing this, so that's great to add cheap and simple animations to your props or whatever. The second vertex animation texture technique is a bit more interesting, but is also a little bit more complex and only actually works for skeletal animations. Instead of baking vertices, positions and normals, this technique encodes the bones location and rotation data into textures and encodes as well the bone index into vertex color, so that a vertex may be sort of parented to a single bone and read the proper bone data from the texture. This technique usually outputs textures way smaller in size and allows for animation blending, works for LODs and so is overall considered a stronger technique. This was for instance used in Star Wars Battlefront 2 to create their efficient crowd system. Again, skeletal meshes can be more expensive than you'd think and they can very quickly become the bottleneck for such crowd systems. So being able to bake those skeletal animations into textures and using static meshes that are way simpler to render can often lead to huge performance benefits. Now, I had something in mind that didn't really fit the use case of either of these two techniques. You see I had those flying rocks and I wanted to make them hover and rotate and so on. Nothing too fancy, nothing too detailed, just a small simple environmental animation. I could have used that first vertex animation texture technique, but considering it outputs per vertex animation data, it'd be extremely wasteful in this case, since the animation here is per actor, so the motion is kinda shared across most of these vertices, right? I could also have made a skeletal mesh and other a skeletal animation in a 3D software, but that's a bit constraining and I wanted to see if something could be done entirely in engine, and so that's what I did. Alright, let's see how that's done then. First, I enabled a sweet plugin called the Sequencer Scripting, which exposes all kinds of functions to Blueprint to get access to a sequencer's data. Let's take a quick look at some of these functions. First, you may give that getBindings node a sequence. A binding is essentially a line, I guess, in the sequencer, right? An actor, a post-process, a camera, whatever you add. For each of these bindings, you can get a list of their tracks. That list would depend on the kind of binding, but most of them, if not all, would have a transform track and whatever else. For each of these tracks, you can then list their sections. For the transform track, that'd be location, rotation and so on. And then for each section, you can find specific channels. 
and I know here that I want to access the location and rotation data and so those are floats for the X location, Y location and so on so I specify a float channel and for each of these float channels you can then do a bunch of interesting stuff like add a key at a specific time, remove a key, sample values and so on this is a non-exhaustive list of the blueprint nodes exposed by this plugin so feel free to take a deeper look by yourself and see what other functions may be useful to you Anyway, I have this capture blueprint that kinda does the same thing here to get the locations and rotations at a fixed time step through the entire sequence animation for all actors and I write each of these location and rotation samples into a texture Alright, let's take a closer look First of all, I made a function that can be called inEditor via this little checkbox. In there, we start by checking if the given sequence is valid, then create a dynamic material instance that will be used to draw onto the render target. That material is just used to write an RGBA pixel, nothing crazy. Then create the render target, its resolution in X is based on the amount of actors times 3, you'll understand why in a second, and its resolution in Y is based on the amount of frames to capture. Now both here need to be a power of 2 for this create static texture node to work. I also make sure they don't exceed a maximum value. Then begin the draw context here and get the bindings of that sequence. Now this, hmm, let's say I reorder the list of these bindings so they match the order of that actor's list. But don't mind this for now, I'll come back to that later on. For each ordered binding, I call this sample sequence transforms function. In there I get the bindings tracks we only really care about the transform tracks though. Then get those tracks sections. Now here I run through each location and rotation sections one first time, just to scan the level sequence and find which of the XYZ location or raw pitch your rotation section has the latest keyframe. They all should really end at the same time though, like so, but if it's not the case, I print out a little warning. Once that preloop is complete and that have that last frame number, I may call this get sequence sample rate function, which will compute both a range and a frame rate. It's like we have an animation lasting x seconds and we want to capture x frames, meaning we want to sample that animation x times at a regular interval and that functions figures that out. Now we'll most likely want to capture looping animations though. So there's this loop option that tells the capture blueprint to skip the last frame because if the level sequence animation does indeed loop the start and end keyframes should be similar and we don't want to sample them twice else there'd be a hiccup when the baked animation loops and so I take that loop option into account in this function to properly compute the correct sample range and frame rate Continuing for each section I get the location and rotation flow channels and call that evaluate keys function to sample those XYZ locations and roll pitch your rotations at a fixed time step through the entire animation. Once all that is done, we make our life easier and we safely combine all these locations and rotations to build a list of transforms. Note that the scale isn't yet supported by that tool. It could be in a future update though. So. Anyway, cool, we have the list of transforms to bake for a single actor. We need a reference point to do some space coordinates transform though. So we cache the very first transform and that's our starting point. Then for each transform we first convert the location at any given time so that it's relative to that first location. So at first it will be zero, right? Why is that? Well, this is going to be used to displace our mesh vertices using our material world position offset, okay? So we don't want an actual world location but an offset meaning how displaced a vertex is from its initial rest position, so that's what we do here. But it also needs to be relative to this actor's location, because you have to keep in mind that all these for no individual actors are going to be merged into a single actor using a procedural mesh component. No, I'm not going to go over that procedural mesh component part in great details, because it's out of the scope of this video, and I actually invite you to check my Patreon. There's this great introduction to the procedural mesh component project available as a tier 2 reward which should teach you everything you need to know about that component. Also note that if you're using UE5 you should probably now use geometry scripting instead. Basically though if we take a quick glance at this construct mesh function I just loop through all listed static mesh actors, get their static mesh component, get the data of that mesh's first section and first LOD and use this vertex normal tangent data 
to build the combined mesh one static mesh actor at a time. While doing that, I also create additional UV maps to store the XYZ pivot location of all these actors, so they all can still be rotated in the material using the baked data and world position offset around their own pivot point once merged. No, I haven't explained that yet, but each actor's transforms are baked into that small anim texture using three pixels. Let's call them pixel A, B, C. So if we have two actors, it's like A, B, C, A, B, C. Once those actors are merged into a single one though, how may I know where to sample that texture to get the transforms of that piece here, and then that one, and so on? Well, that's done with an index encoded in UVs, so that once combined into a single mesh, each vertex kinda remembers from which actor it was from, and may use that index to shift the coordinates at which to sample that animation texture and read the proper displacement. And that's also why I do this reordering here. Because you may add bindings in a totally random way in that level sequence, I need to make sure the order in which those are looped through for the baking process matches the order of that actor list here, so that the index encoded in UVs points to the correct transforms in that anim texture. I apologize if that all may sound a bit obscure, but yeah, it's a limitation I had to work around with that small hack. It's also why it's critical to have the same actor's name in the level sequence than in your scene, because the reordering is done via a simple name lookup. I haven't found a better way to do that yet, but building those kind of tools entirely in engine often requires you to find creative ways to go around limitations. Anyway, I was saying, now that we have that displacement relative to the center of our combined static mesh, we write those three pixels per actor per transform. We draw a first pixel that contains the X location in the red channel and the forward vector in the three remaining channels. The alpha channel cannot store negative values, so it needs to be remapped like so. Then do the same thing but for the Y and Z location and the right and up vectors, shifting the draw location by one pixel to the right each time. Repeat that for all transforms, each time shifting the draw location by one pixel downward to build this list of transforms on the Y axis. You might be wondering why I store the forward, right and up vectors though. Well, I guess I could have stored a rotation axis and rotation angle, but I really was looking to have a very performant solution, and I wanted to avoid having to use trigonometry in the material to recreate those rotations, like the skeletal vertex animation baking method does. Don't get me wrong, it's not necessarily bad, but I wanted to see if I could avoid that. Sine and cosine are not the cheapest thing ever to compute, right? Another solution would be to store the rotation as a quaternion, which, by the way, could be further packed into a single flow channel, like explained in my Twitter post here. Very interesting technique. So I could do something like XYZ location in RGB, and then pack the quaternion in the remaining alpha channel. But then I think I need to do quite a bit of math to turn that quaternion into a rotation for the world position offset. No, I'm not too familiar with using quaternions in materials, so I might be wrong here, but I found that post which demonstrates precisely that, and it involves some trigonometry, so I don't know. I think my approach, despite requiring three texture samplers, is cheaper because I can use those forward, right and up axis with a simple 3x3 three three matrix to recreate those rotations super cheaply, right? It's just a bunch of multiply. Don't take my word for it though, I didn't try and profile those different solutions to be honest, I'm just trusting my guts. Anyway, now that we covered pretty much the entirety of that blueprint, let's actually talk briefly about the material function used to play the baked animation. It's quite straightforward to use, specify the vertex animation texture, the duration, and here I may use a multiplier stored in UVs to speed up or slow down the animation play rate. That is done because this tool supports different animation lengths, like demonstrated here. It's very useful if you need to have different rotation rates, for instance. You see that actor has a shorter animation than that one, but all animations will be baked with the same number of samples, or frames if you will, so the time step may actually be different. So the material, when reading the animation texture, has to speed up or slow down for some actors to match the initial animation speed, and that's computed here, when the combined mesh is being constructed and stored in UVs. Now, inside that material function, there are three texture samplers to recombine the locations and rotations from those three ABC pixels, if you remember. 
Essentially, here we sample the texture to get the A pixel, meaning the X location and forward axis, of a specific actor at a specific time. And here we do the same thing but shift the texture coordinates by one pixel to the left and then one more to the left to get the remaining YZ location and right and up axis. Once we have that, we use the location to shift vertices and do a transform matrix for the rotation around each actor's pivot point and also fix the normals. And voila, we end up with that beautiful result. One nice thing I have to mention here though, we can get away with using such tiny textures because we actually leverage the fact that we'll sample the texture in Y coordinates in between pixels to get a linear interpolation for free. What I mean by that? Well, let's say there's an offset in X of 100 units encoded in the red channel of that pixel here, and then 200 units in the next one below. We'll slowly scroll the texture vertically to play the animation, right? And so for instance, at one point, we'll probably have a sample location in Y right in between those pixels. And thus, those two pixels will be averaged and the sample will output 150 units, which is precisely in between 100 and 200, like expected. Thus, a linear interpolation for free. And really, that's how we can capture our 15 seconds animations quite precisely with just 32 pixels. Now that's also because the animation isn't super detailed here and can be approximated quite nicely in our case, but still it's a nice trick. Now I must mention a few limitations. Because of the way I build that combined static mesh actor using the procedural mesh component, only the first UV map of those actors will be conserved if you will, so that may be annoying. Using UE5's geometry scripting may solve this issue. I'll have to take a look at it at some point, but for now that's something to keep in mind. Although that tool only works for static mesh actors having one single static mesh of a single section. Also LODs will not be conserved, but those are easy enough to reconstruct and that vertex animation technique works out of the box with LODs, which is great. Voila, I think I covered pretty much everything. Hopefully most of it made sense. As usual, if you have any question, feel free to reach out to me in the comment section below. In case you do want to try this tool or want to support me, it's available as a tier 3 reward on my Patreon. Link will be in the video description below. Thanks so much for your support and your time. Consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel if you like the content. I'll see you in the next video. Take care of yourself. Bye bye.